Hi, and welcome to Building Resilience. Today, I'm talking with Kathleen Sutcliffe and Tim Vogus. Kathy is a professor of management and organization health at the Carey Business School, Johns Hopkins University. Tim is a professor of management at the Vanderbilt University. We talk about systemic, organizational, and individual resilience, starting from the healthcare and education systems to designing organizations and work that are shaped to foster resilience. We look into everyday HR practices that lead to noticing weak signals of vulnerability and deviations and remind ourselves that resilience is probabilistic, impermanent, and something we have to intently focus on. Through this podcast, we are bringing resilience research and practice closer to you. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Your views and your feedback are extremely important to the development of the podcast. Enjoy our conversation. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, team, and welcome to Building Resilience. Hi, Yulia. Thank you for inviting me and, t- and Tim. Hi, Yulia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here, Yulia. Uh, I was actually looking forward to this conversation on organizational resilience, but just as an introduction, would you be okay to tell me a bit about your work and how did you get interested in studying organizational resilience? I I can start. Um, I I don't know that I made this conscious decision to study resilience, but I think that the the formative experience that I had that really led me in in the direction of the kinds of research that I do really related to living in in the Aleutian Islands in the United States. I lived in a place called Dutch Harbor. Uh, on, it was also called Unalaska. It's known as the one of the largest fishing ports in the United States. And there is a U.S. show called The Deadliest Catch about fishing in that area. And I lived there for quite a few years, and it was uh, the U.S. Coast Guard talks about on Alaska Dutch Harbor as having the worst weather in the world. And also, just to tell you where it is, it is in the middle of the ocean where the Bering Sea and the Pacific Ocean come together. And I can attest to the fact that you couldn't rely on anything, that you had to be incredibly uh, adaptable and resilient because you could think that the plane was going to be coming in to either bring supplies or to take you off the island. And it wouldn't be there for days because it was visual flying weather. So uh, planes oftentimes came all the way out there and had to go all the way back without landing. Anyway, that that was kind of, I, I don't know. I mean, I was really interested in how organizations manage under those kinds of conditions and actually how individuals manage as well. So, so as will be the case throughout the entirety of this podcast, uh, my examples are going to be much less interesting and exotic than things that Kathy says, because she has lived every possible interesting experience in human existence. <laughs> uh, so my uh, two paths into organizational resilience are a little bit more mundane. Uh, so one of them was, you know, so I came to graduate school uh, at University of Michigan, uh, working with Kathy. Um looking for an answer to the question of how do human resource practices, bundles of human resource practices affect organizational performance. And I was really interested in understanding what's that black box in the middle? What are the mechanisms by which that occurs? And I came across early in my graduate studies there, this spectacular and uh, very well-cited paper by uh, uh, White, Sutcliffe, and Obstfeld uh, in research and organizational behavior on organizational uh, and collective mindfulness. And reading through that, resilience is a big component of that. And when I read about the, the mechanisms and the processes that I, they identified, it was like everything snapped together for me. And it was like, yes, this is the explanation I was searching for that I didn't even know, right? Like it just fit perfectly to explain that. I also have a related personal experience about the time that I was uh, starting to do my dissertation in uh, 2002. My son, Aiden, was born. And when he was born at University of Michigan Hospital, there was a a handoff uh, while my partner, Jen, was was pushing, right? Like right in the middle of it, they said it was shift change. People, they handed off uh, uh, one, one nurse to the other. And there were also some things that they were kind of trying to make sense of, like some kind of readings on, you know, uh, that were coming out as she was pushing and they were, try, you know, trying to figure them out together. And what was really impressive about that is under 
you know, really extreme conditions, how well they did that together. So it, they were quite resilient in the moment where there were some kind of unexpected things going on. They're in a high stress moment of the of of the delivery. And I just kind of filed that away as a memory of, huh, this is interesting because this is happening. But at the same time, we know there are all kinds of errors that are going on in healthcare organizations that lead to many deaths in the U.S., but also across the globe. Um, so those were kind of my two things that got me into resilience. One was kind of the scholarly track and one was kind of the experiential where I had this, you know, uh, this example. But you're both studying healthcare systems, right? And the resilience of the healthcare mm -hmm. systems. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, but I think that we've also um, been interested in resilience more, more broadly a across lots of industries and lots of types of organizations. Yep. Yeah, healthcare. Healthcare is a rich environment for uh, understanding resilience and also understanding brittleness. Yeah. So the kind of opposite of <laughs> exactly. resilience. So we've been we we've uh, made we've spent a long time trying to. Uh, figure that out and kind of push things ahead in a more resilient direction. Well, I think during COVID, you had a lot of observation ground with the healthcare healthcare systems. Any thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I I, I have a thought on it, and I I think that on the one hand, I think that the that healthcare in many ways has been remarkably resilient. I mean, I think of the way that, and and also I think. Um, in, in my perspective, universities as well have been remarkably resilient in terms of turning on a dime with the way that we would deliver classes, et cetera. And I think healthcare is, is the same, but I think at, this, at the same time, we saw that there were... Um, there was brittleness. I mean, that supply chains were not as as resilient as we had imagined. Uh, personal protective equipment, those kinds of things, that there were shortages. And I think uh, I think healthcare systems, individual hospitals, organizations were able to adapt pretty pretty well. At the same time, one of the things that we know, and that's been shown in earlier studies of, of pandemics on SARS and MERS, is that a significant number of people in the healthcare system will have some lasting effects of anxiety and stress and, and burnout. And I, I don't think uh, we know exactly how many that will be, but in previous studies, it's been shown to be about 30% of the workforce. I think, though, I have also seen evidence that some people found really became very resilient, that they saw this as an opportunity to do the kinds of things that they trained for. And so rather than really burning them out, it it actually, you know, made them feel better about the work that they were doing. Tim, I, I, I don't know what what what's your take on that? Okay. Yeah. So, so building on that kind of, uh, the last point Kathy was making about the kind of burnout and exhaustion, and then some people kind of feeling more, you know, energized by it. Um, so that's informed some of the work that I've been doing, uh, around compassion and compassion systems and the realizing the need for more kind of focused interventions to help people process their trauma in a systematic kind of way. And this relates to some work that uh, Laura McClelland at Virginia Commonwealth University and I have been doing on an ongoing basis for several years where we've been looking at these sets of compassion practices. How do we reward, recognize, and support uh, compassionate acts, but also give people forums for processing trauma. And those kind of things, uh, I think, became even more essential and more important. And rather than just cascading down to the individuals, hey, you process your individual trauma. Here's a here, get on Headspace. Here's a mindfulness app. Go figure it out. Here's, uh, you know, some re individual resilience training. You know, be more resilient. Be more resourceful. Uh, but instead, th you know, giving people the experience of kind of having some of the the emotional support, but also the support of processing these events and thinking about how can we do things better, more systematically, so that we don't experience these kind of. Uh, emotional and personal disruptions, as well as organizational disruptions. The other thing that uh, COVID brought to light for me that maybe was obvious for a lot of people, but it wasn't obvious for me, is um, how the importance of the kind of removal of families, 
personal caregivers from those caregiving uh, settings. So kind of those people can't be in the hospital anymore for good reason, right? Like we're worried about more people getting infected. And also maybe some of the quote unquote non-essential uh, care providers like social workers or chaplains or patient navigators or these other kind of support professionals who get um, who give in, uh, important insights about the state of a patient and uh, you know the safety of care delivery. Uh, all the, with all those folks being removed, what we've seen in some of the data is safety culture uh, kind of dropping off. We've seen increases in harm, like falls and errors of other kinds of variety, you know, uh, medication, misadministrations, those kind of things. And also, you know, not detecting people's deterioration as soon as we might otherwise. So, you know, some of the study the things I've been writing about as a result are how do we make sure those perspectives keep getting fed into the system? You know, the perspectives of families and other kinds of personal support, even when, uh, we are under these extreme kind of circumstances. And how do we think about highly reliable performance and resilient performance as being something that's done uh, beyond just the kind of trained professionals, but all the kind of support and broader infrastructure that, that people bring in the care delivery setting? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Tim's, Tim raised this issue with me a, a couple months ago about the importance of families and and just how during COVID, um, the lack of family participation in, in care has probably contributed, as he said, to this uh, decline in safety culture and an and increase in adverse events or errors. And it really does high, you know, the healthcare system probably doesn't really understand the extent to which families get, can give information about weak signals, about, yep. you know, the, the things that are starting to kind of go wrong. They're not quite right, but we don't know quite how to make sense of this. And, and just the, the value of uh, a diversity and range of, of perspectives that, that are necessary to enable uh, healthcare providers and the healthcare system to have a really good understanding and of what what we're facing, so I, I think I think this is such a really interesting research avenue that comes out of this COVID thing that I think is going to be really important. Yeah, I never I never thought because first when you started to mention it, I thought it was mostly emotional support for the patient, right? Because that mm -hmm. helps as well, helps them get better and, and so on. But now as you're talking about it, it's more about helping the health care industry make sense of what's happening to the patient so they can provide better care. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's even something that under, I think, under even good circumstances, uh, health care organizations are highly variable in the extent to which they engage patients and their families and other kinds of forms of, you know, friends, other forms of support that accompany them in the care delivery process. So I think the, the removal though highlights the importance in the kind of everyday setting, but especially the importance under these kind of very difficult circumstances. Yeah. I don't want to lose Tim's earlier point, the the point about emotional, um, the emotional engagement and the, um, I think that then the relational issues, because I think what we're really starting to learn is that it's, you know, that emotions and affect and relationships are central to, to resilience. Um, and that, you know, and I know we're going to, we're going to touch on this later, but the way that you can think about resilience as kind of having two major organizational resilience and perhaps, you know, individual resilience as well, but having two kind of major streams, the idea that resilience is something that you have, that it's optimism or resources or, or some kinds of capacities that enable you to, um, to perform well under adverse conditions, or you can think about it as something that you do and that it is an interactional, interrelational process um, and so I, I, th I think that, Tim, what you were saying really kind of brings up and highlights those, those perspectives. Yeah. But yeah. is it either or, or can it be both? Yeah. No, I mean, from my perspective, I think, I think it's both. I don't, I don't think it's either or. I think it's I, absolutely. I think it's both, <laughs> Tim. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree. I completely agree with that. Do you have, um, how do you define both of you or organizational resilience or even resilience? Because there isn't 
one common definition, one definition yeah. everyone agrees on. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, the three the three definitions that I often use when I teach or um, or speak or you know in in my work is really the first definition is the one that you typically see, and that's the ability to withstand uh, some kind of um, strain and to perform well. Uh, in the face of that strain, within bounds, you know, and so that's one definition. The second definition is really the capability to bend without breaking or to spring back, so the capability to recover. And then the third definition that I think about is this idea of um, the ability to learn and grow and to adapt over time. Um, Tim, I don't know if I'm missing something. Yeah. No, those that, that's you hit on it exactly. I think that's a really nice kind of encapsulation of the various ways in which people have defined it. And sometimes those are treated as intention, but I think the way uh, Kathy and I think about it most times, it's like it's all those yeah. things, right? Like so, to your earlier question, Yulia, uh, you know, is about well, is it either or? And no, it's kind of a both and. And that's some of what makes it so challenging, right? Like because it's keeping all these things in play. And it's not just fixating on, okay, we just need to absorb some strain and just kind of keep limping along. But, and I think one thing that Kathy and I have done in some of our writing is really push on that learning and growing aspect of it, that about that positive adjustment of becoming more resourceful and more capable from engaging in this, as opposed to just kind of bouncing back to where we were before. Right. Because when you think about bouncing back, you can bounce back to, you know, a, a, a lower state of, of functioning exactly. or you can bounce back to a, a higher state or the same state or whatever. I mean, I, I don't yep. know, Yuli, I know you were going to you were going to ask us another question, but one one uh, point that I want to I want us to hang on to, because I think it's so central and it's critical to Tim's and my work is is that um if you think about the multiplicity of definitions, it really does beg the question, you know, at what at what point is resilience either most important or when is when does it take place? You know, is it is, if you think about um, the capability to spring back, that suggests that resilience comes after, you know. Um, but if you think about this ability to absorb strain, that that talks about, you know, that raises the issue of during, you know, that you're absorbed, that you're resilient as something is happening. And, and I, and, and Tim and I have made the point that it's also critical, uh, to be resilient beforehand, because I think there's such a, one of the things that I think that we, um, forget often is that if you think about, the fact that resilience is enacted, that it, it comes about through human environment interactions that suggests that we create the environments to which we then respond. And so resilience is more of a, a process is how, is how I think about it. Very, very interesting. And it's very interesting to think that it happens before as well, not only during or after a certain event, because yeah. that also means that you can prepare. Yeah. So are there mechanisms, like you already spoke about the processes, but are there practices, beliefs, structures that gives rise to this resilience, that makes some more resilient than others? Yeah, so I, I want to build, I'll build a little bit on that, on that kind of preparatory element. So I think sometimes, and I kind of foreshadowed this a little bit when I told you what I was interested in, and long ago, that kind of informs uh, my work. So uh, these ideas of everyday human resource practices, right? Like things that we might not think of as a source of resilience, we might think of those as exactly the opposite, right? Like the things that get in the way, the rules, the, you know, the organizational police who are just interested in kind of punishing people for doing wrong things. Uh, but I think one of the things that's important about these human resource practices is you can marshal them in a way that you're creating the conditions for resilience to follow. And what kind of things can you do? So in uh, some of the work that Kathy is deeply informed uh, around this is thinking about how do you design your work? Do you design it in a more kind of flexible, empowered way so people are able to grow their competence and, and kind of test their capabilities, but also have the flexibility to respond to emergent conditions, right? Like, so that's a foundational kind of thing. To what extent is your work designed in that way? That's an HR job. Um, and also thinking about how people are selected. 
Are they selected for just for, you know, this is a big issue in healthcare. Are they selected just for their technical expertise or are they selected for their interpersonal skills as well and their ability to collaborate and to kind of make sense of unexpected events? And then do we supplement that with kind of investments in the relational, the interpersonal, the discursive uh, that's uh, going on in the organization. So we're training people on like how to interact in more effective ways, how to work it co more collaboratively. And those are some things that I think are practices that can be put in place that are really straightforward. And the org almost every organization has variants of those things, but they can be shaped in a slightly different way to foster more resilience. So thinking about resilience as the goal. So how do we set up a system that produces resilience? Yeah. yeah I mean, I think the quote, the question that you're saying, you know, is how, how do we create it? I mean, I think Tim's absolutely right. Focusing on those things. I mean, there's a whole long list of things in the literature about how it, how it gets created through, you know, um, trying to make, to assure that you have particular communication processes and and meaning management processes and relational processes building these kinds of things um, those things are critical and also uh, as as you pointed out earlier the idea of having some other capacities and and structures in place the idea resources is is critical and uh, I, I think you know resources both financial but also uh, cognitive resources knowledge, for example, and uh, a constructive vision or a set of goals and these kinds of things, um, you know, trying to enable people to speak about their emotions, going back to Tim's earlier comment. I think all of these things are, are critical and we, we could do, we could do a long list of them. We could probably teach multiple classes on, on them, <laughs> yep, but, <sure. laughs> but you know, those are, those are a few, a few things. I mean, I want to, I want to go back to something that Tim was talking about, you know, about, um, thinking about the design issues and the mundane kinds of things, because I think the, Mundan mundanity, if that's a word, uh, really does lead to organizational vulnerability. So I think we talk about what fuels resilience, but I think it's really an interesting issue to talk about what fuels organizational vulnerability. And vulnerability is is a pretty mundane thing, and some researchers have have shown that it you know it comes. Organizations become more vulnerable on when two things happen. One is when they start to kind of um, tolerate uh, routine operational errors or they start to just uh, not carry out procedures the way that they had anticipated earlier or when they have weak monitoring and control practices when um, the organizational culture starts to become a little bit misaligned with what the the uh, mission and the vision and and the particular goals are so that's one thing when you know these operational and organizational imperfections occur but also when when managers and leaders uh, become ignorant when they become too defensive uh, in the face of information that disconfirms what you know they're trying to say or when they develop a simplified view of the world and they uh, aren't looking very deeply at at how we're actually acting so I I think I just love this idea of thinking about organizational vulnerability. And uh, honestly, I'd like to know more about that. Yeah. And I think I think what Kathy just said about organizational vulnerability, I think that the path breaking work that she's done around high reliability organizing and that I've kind of, uh, you know, partnered with her in and some of the uh, more recent iterations of that is a direct response to those feel those sources of organizational vulnerability. So how do we make more things discussable? How do we, in advance, spend time thinking about, you know, what could go wrong and actually having conversations about that? What are what are the ways in which our system's vulnerable? So how do we combat ignorance? Conversations like that and making that part of our everyday conversations, part of something we talk about in meetings regularly, the most mundane of contexts. How do we question our assumptions? You know, are we more reluctant to simplify our interpretations? Do we have a good sense of what the organization's current state actually is? Where are we? Are we vulnerable? Are we drifting? Are we, you know, or are we, you know, kind of hitting the right notes? And then, you know, how are we treating things that are 
small deviations and disruptions? Are they opportunities for learning or is it a way to kind of you know, blame somebody? And then when problems emerge, you know, who's resolving them? Is it just the people with the, the most formal authority or are we deferring to the local expertise, the people who might have real insight into the unique nature of these problems because they're encountering it on a regular basis? And that also, some of that deference to expertise also links to some of those kind of practice-based choices and those design choices I was talking about a little bit earlier. But I think those kind of things that are intentionally about fostering the kind of conversations that combat vulnerability are another real uh, key source of resilience. Is there a way in which organizations can find out how vulnerable they are? Because while you were talking, I was thinking that if people get into defensive mode and when the, they start to tolerate mm -hmm. errors, they might not notice that they are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They might not, mm -hmm. because of that defensiveness, right? It's just protective. So you're not, you're not even getting into that discussion. You're just going with the flow. So it's a downward slope from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who would need to recognize this and how would they recognize that they are actually in a vulnerable state? Yeah, Tim, what do you think? I mean, I'm thinking that it would go back to um, taking a look at departures or, um, you know, having, I mean, lots of organizations do culture kinds of surveys, you know, trying to yeah. have a sense of, of uh, you know, where we're at with our culture, what people are Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question, Yulia, and I, I, I haven't so much thought about it, but I'd be thinking about weak signals with respect to departures and some HR, HR uh, metrics that organizations that you could discern whether people are, you know, a little concerned. We're not quite sure what's going on. What do you, what do you think, Tim? Yeah, I think nudging people in the direction if you know, because somebody has to recognize that there is some kind of deviation, sure. right? Like we're somehow off course, right? So somebody needs to recognize that in order to nudge it at all. But I think uh, some of the things that Kathy's suggesting around trying to measure, I mean, I think some of those things around, are we actually having conversations where we're spending time talking about what could go wrong, right? Like, so kind of auditing ourselves in that kind of way, asking those types of questions and just kind of embedding those things in meetings so we don't get to the point where we're, you know, creating more vulnerability. Right? Like, and just kind of doing a regular kind of audit of those things. And I think some of the things that we've been talking about also pair well with some of the work on psychological safety, which is about, you know, do people feel safe to take an interpersonal risk? So that's another kind of thing you can audit and measure easily in these kind of culture surveys or other types of things. Or if there are, um, and I think also thinking about what are the outcome measures that we're assessing? Are they things that are very far removed and have a long lag time to lead to them? Or are we checking about some inner intermediate kind of process measures and indications. So when Kathy was saying departures, I was thinking about also like the airline industry, like what are the <laughs> kind of earlier signals, like we're losing bags <laughs> yeah, or we're right. doing, you know, we're, yeah. we're departing not on time. And that might be a, you know, an early indicator of, you know, something bigger and badder is going to happen because we're not paying attention to the small stuff. We're losing that picture. We're lo And I think one other thing that leaders can do if, because there are a lot of times and Kathy, uh, uh And Carl Weick wrote this great paper about cultures of entrapment in the Bristol Royal Infirmary. So it was a, it was definitely like the, the Uber case of uh, managerial ignorance and ignoring those signals and kind of defensive protection against all this accumulating evidence. Uh, but one thing that leaders can do in organizations that I think is a, a, another mundane thing is get spend some time on the frontline operations, get closer to where the actual work's carried out and kind of talk to people about it. What are the things that they're worried about? Because some of the times the uh, ignoring and the defensiveness is because I don't have a good feel, so I assume everything's great because I'm at a remove from what's actually going on on the front line. So kind of get open your eyes to what the frontline realities are, I think can also be a helpful move there. Yeah. I, I mean, let me just weigh in and, and second what Tim was saying, be, and I think it, it relates to this little, um, this, this, I don't know how I would describe it, but I, I have this intuition that in addition to really paying attention to psychological safety, which of course, you know, People have been talking about this for years. Amy's Amy Edmondson's work is is fabulous and and it's really critical. But my concern about psychological safety and it's a concern that has come up with the with studying healthcare 
is that we are trying to encourage people who are generally thought of as low status, you know, not necessarily highly educated in all cases, and that we are we are attempting to change the behavior of people who are in low status positions um, to do really important things when we all, and I think that's important, but at the same time, I think that we need to also, as Tim was saying, be focusing on leaders and managers and making sure that they're asking for input and that they're observing and that, you know, and that we should be looking at, at their behaviors and are they interacting sufficiently with the people on the front lines? So the people on the front lines know that they really do care about what they think and, and, you know, that they, that they expect them to, uh, that they, that they respect them and they, they expect them to have self-respect to speak up. But I also think we should be focusing on the high status people and making sure that, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Anyway, I don't don't know if that makes sense, but. It makes, makes perfect sense. And that's, and that's key to that idea of deference expertise, right? Like, so you solicit that, but then you, then leaders actually need to act on what they hear too. And to show those folks on the front line that they acted on it, their input mattered, and they've cha- made changes that are making those conditions better emotionally, psychologically, the uh, safety-wise, right? Like that, they're, that the improvements are actually occurring, and the and the voice was heard. Yeah, and the, I mean the other thing too, Yulia, is is I I studied the the oil and gas industry. Um, and I never published any any work on this, but I, I have done several studies. And and one of the th- one of the practices, the daily practices on oil rigs is is called the safety observations and conversations. And and the supervisors are evaluated on the extent to which they go out every day and they have conversations with people uh, doing the work on the front lines. And um, what you know what this does is is that it helps leaders well it's 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 two things it you know it helps leaders really understand how are people actually doing the work but then it also helps those people who are doing the work to understand what risks might be there that they're not seeing and that you i mean when you have these conversation you're you're socializing people into seeing more um, in their environment than they, than they might have. And I mean, it's, it's, it's always shocking to me how you just make assumptions. We make assumptions about, well, you know, people probably seeing the same risks I am, but it's not the case. You know, people oftentimes aren't seeing, seeing anything. It's weird. Or they see quite a lot of things (laughs) because they're very perceptive. But that, this, uh, this discussion leads me to the importance of trust and in resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, we've written a little bit about that and also about uh, respect too, right? Like, so, uh, you know, and so kind of self-respect and mutual respect, right? Like, so the willingness to kind of, uh, you know, respecting what I see as valid and being willing to kind of take that interpersonal risk and bring it up and that it's also going to be received as input that we can build upon. But you're right. It's the ability to, to feel trusted and to see others as trustworthy too, right? Like, because it relies on those kind of relational foundations in order for it to work for sure, Julia. Yeah. And we, you know, we talk a lot about trust uh, and trust is really critical. I'm this, uh, let let me also say that I think Tim's point about self-respect, that we aren't spending enough time in organizations to really help people understand that they do need to understand, they do need to have respect themselves, that they have insight that other people don't have and that is valuable and that it's it's their responsibility to make sure that they get their view out there um but going back to trust i mean one of the when i talk to healthcare audiences and i think tim pointed this out to me a, a, a long while back is that people don't really understand the depth of what goes on in organizations to make trust. Because if you think about trust as kind of having a cognitive component and an affective component, and the cognitive component is the idea that if you trust somebody, you're likely to think that they're competent, that they have character, and they can do what they're saying they're going to do, that they have influence. But the affective part of it is that they um, that they have your back, right? But think about those cognitive pieces. They're competent, 
they have character, they have influence. Competent means they're highly trained. So if you think about if you're going to build a trust, a system that's going to trust, or you know, if you're going to build an organization where people trust each other, then people have to be really well trained. I mean, you, ha you have to dig down into each one of those things. They have implications for organization and organizational actions. And I think we don't think that way. You know, we think things are going right. to magically happen. And anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that integrity component to the, like the kind of people will follow through on what they say is, you know, one of the essential things that we've been talking about throughout, right? Like yeah. with these kind of sources of organizational vulnerability, a lot of times it's saying one thing, doing another, right? Like in not having that kind of behavioral integrity and consistency. Yeah, maybe that still goes back to recruitment and having that conscientiousness aspect. Yeah. Both in yeah. the organization. I, yeah. No, it's that, I mean, for that's sure. a start for sure. Agree. Yep. yep. If we do all of this magic as HR people <laughs> or, or, or org designers and we put everything in place, yeah. we, we have the right um, uh, work set up, we have the right communication, culture, relationships and everything, is uh, resilience guaranteed? Or do we have the right building blocks so we can face anything? I think that's a really good question. I mean, and it's it's a little bit like uh, you know, in our work that that we've done on reliability, and it, it's you know, are you is organizing in a particular way? Does it mean that you're never going to screw up? Uh, no, <laughs> because we live in complex systems, and we know that right. things can interact in in ways that we hadn't anticipated. And that's just you know, that's uh, that's what we have to uh, to deal with. Um, I think the likely, I think it's a probability, the likelihood of being able to perform well is, uh, is better. Um, but it, it's not, it's not necessarily guaranteed. Uh, what about you, Tim? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I completely agree with what you described. It's, it's not a guarantee, but I do think there is probably better management of the fluctuations. So you'll, you're more likely to see things earlier when it's more possible to intervene and arrest them sooner, mm -hmm. right? Like, and start, and start those kind of, you know, bounce back, the learning and growth, those kind of ele elements of organizational resilience that we were talking about. So it's probabilistic. Uh, you're building more capacities, capabilities, and processes for for doing that kind of work. But the, as soon as you think, and this is something Kathy and I both say a lot, as soon as you think you've got everything figured out and you have a resilient organization, <laughs> look out, those people are dangerous, <laughs> yeah. right? So, exactly. so Maybe that's the moment you need to start questioning again. Yes, that's exactly. When you have this that's thought, a, it's like, oh, this is it. This perfect. is when I need to... Uh, yeah. Yes. Reflect on what I'm actually thinking about. Yeah, exactly. That's the moment for that audit. Somebody hand you a survey, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you're a little too confident. No, you're right. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, then when things do happen, you know, you have to think about what, you know, how you're going to manage. I mean, when something does break through, I think it's really critical what comes at that point. And, um, I wanted to ask you about sense making and resilience, because both uh, yourselves and Deborah Ancona and the others write about this. But I was looking uh, the other days for some exercises to build this sense making or something practical that organizations can actually use to build this muscle. But I couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. I found a lot of theory on sense making and why it is important, but I couldn't find anything practical. Yeah, well, I mean, some people say that sense making never starts because it never stops, right? So, I mean, we're constantly we're constantly doing it. You can't you can't make sense. You can't make a decision before you make sense. Once you have the story, then you know what you're going to do. So, uh, <laughs> but I don't know, Tim. What do you, what do you think, Tim, about exercises or practices? Um, so, I think I. It's a, it's a really good question. It's a hard question. And your, your points about, uh, you know, what's written about it. Yeah. There's a lot of great theory and a lot of great case studies and things like that of other people making sense, but how can I grow my competence with it? That's a, that is a harder question. I mean, so some things, I think what Kathy was saying about getting the story. So if you're, if you think about sense-making where I'm joining an organization, 
I think some ways to engage and practice your sense making is to get people to tell stories, right? Like to try to induce stories of others, because that'll give you a sense in a way that other things won't. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, do you have any stories about people who are a rock star in this organization and why, right? Like this is a little bit removed from resilience, but it's all, but it's more about kind of sense making. Cause when you get people to start talking narratively, they're giving you more, a more encapsulated and complete world. So I think there's some of, uh, some of that can be about sense making, um, Matthew Grimes at Cambridge and I've done a little bit of work on, what we call possibilistic thinking. And so what that is, is about kind of, you know, returning to first principles and kind of thinking about kind of stripping down the world that you're existing in and what is at the core of it, right? So that's a way of kind of a self-guided imaginative process where you kind of st take a step back at what's the really stripped down to its most basic element. What is it that I'm trying to accomplish? What is this organization about? What is it trying to do? I think that could be kind of an exercise. And I also think some of the stuff that uh, Kathy and I have done around uh, mindful organizing can be ways of practicing sense-making too, where you just have in every meeting, we're going to talk about what should we be worried about? You know, who needs to know about what we're doing? What are the downstream consequences? You know, how are we linked to other parts of this organization? What are assumptions we're making? And what are the things that we're ignoring, right? Like just kind of constantly revisiting and uh, challenging yourself in that kind of way. I know that might feel exhausting and that might sound like a terrible practice, but if one's trying to grow their capacity to make sense and to kind of see weak signals sooner and to kind of process them, I think just the kind of everyday grounded practice and where, you know, so some of those things I mentioned, the kind of possibilistic thinking is more intra-psychic, right? Like individual level practice and these other ones about if you're joining an organization, asking people to tell the stories of that organization, or if you're in meetings, kind of asking these questions, those are more kind of dyadic or group level kind of ways of doing it too and practicing it together. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's great. The other thing that I I think is really an interesting practice that I sometimes um, highlight to when I'm speaking to leaders is to keep track of your expectations. So uh, at you know at the end of the I mean at the beginning of the day or or the week or whatever time frame you want to think about you know talk about what you're expecting is going to come about um, and then take a, a you know, revisit that at the end of the day or the week, you know, did my expectations come to fruition? What surprised me that I didn't expect to happen? What, you know, did I, what did happen that I didn't expect? Um, and, and keep track that way. So I think that's a way of kind of, um, strengthen, you know, I, I mean, in a way it's, it's strengthening the, you can figure out, well, what, why didn't I pick up on that? Or, you know, you can, you can broaden the range of factors that then you're paying attention to, you know, Carl Weick and, and I often go head to head about this idea that he suggests that sense-making is always about plausibility. And I agree that you, I mean, that it's always plausible because you can't really know what's going to happen before it happens. But at the same time, we know that in some situations that a more accurate understanding of what we're facing is critical. And uh, Marlis Christensen has shown that in her work on updating and medical teams. And I think that you can have more or less plausible uh, you know, views or, or stories of what you're facing. And, and I would say, um, yeah, these little, these little actions I think are really critical to being able to be better at it. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure a lot of people will get a lot of good advice from, uh, from this. One other question. Is there a downside to chasing resilience? Well, we know there are downsides to resilience. Okay. Tim, you want to talk about some? I mean, I can go, you go ahead first. All right. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the big things about, you know, a resilience mindset can sometimes become every individual, you just be resilient or we're a resilient organization. So that means we don't have to make the investments 
that are more systematic and systemic in the organization because we have the capabilities to respond to whatever is going to unfold upon us. So we can just kind of push that down to the workforce. The workforce will make it happen and we're resilient. But that you know, can be fragile, especially when you have unexpected things like a pandemic and everybody's burnt out and exhausted and those long lingering consequences, like Kathy mentioned earlier on with PTSD and other these kind of depression, other kinds of kind of lingering uh, conditions as a result of that, you know, if you're relying on, you know, we are resilient, our workforce is resilient, you're probably not doing enough structurally to help make that happen and to help keep that workforce resilient. So I think that's one of the the dark sides is it could become a little bit too much pushing down on the workforce without making the corresponding kind of organizational investments. I, I think Tim's example is, is is spot on and that that happens a lot in nurses, just to give a, a practical example, um, is that there has been work by Anita Tucker in particular uh, showing that nurses are wildly resilient in hospitals. Every day they have to do workarounds. And that as a consequence of that, that the organization starts thinking, oh, you know, we're good. We're great. We Everybody knows how to manage under X conditions. And that, but then leaders and supervisors never really dig down deep or they never get a chance to really understand where our, our our problems and to make changes. And then it just is a bad cycle and people get more burned out, et cetera. So, but the, the other, I mean, there are some other negative aspects and, and I think Tim kind of alluded to this when he said that if you've got a too positive self-conception or to these, you know, positive illusions that organizations can get or people can get and that, um, it, it inhibits learning is that if people think, well, we've already got it licked, then there's no reason to change or no reason to dig in. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we know from some research on teams is that when teams escape disaster, that they sometimes underestimate the danger of a future similar kind of situation. Yep. And yep. so they can engage in more risky behaviors. Um, so I think there are downsides. We don't talk about them a lot. And I think that uh, it's a great area for research. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. And um, one, I wanted to ask a question about uh, do we always need to think about risks and be a bit on the pessimist side, but you've just told me that actually, no, when teams actually underestimate danger, then they're more on the hopeful and optimistic side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So both of this can lead to resilience or to lack of resilience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing, one thing Kathy and I with uh, Naomi Rothman and Carl Weick have written about is about balancing doubt and hope. So it's about keeping those things high in intention, kind of almost experience emotional ambivalence between the two where you're like, uh, we're doubting our ability to know everything, right? Like, so we know we have to be aware, vigilant, but also we're hopeful because we believe in our capabilities to respond once we kind of unearth something and that we can work through things. So it's kind of keeping both of those things in play. So it's not just pure optimism or pure pessimism, pure hope, pure doubt, but it's about both of those things kind of simultaneously. And I know that can feel hard to do at the same time, but that's, and maybe you sequence them or, you know, and that's why you build them into some of these kind of everyday settings where we're saying, you know, where are we vulnerable? That's doubt. But we also have expertise that we can defer to. That's hopeful, yeah. right? Like, so having both of those things kind of in play, I think are are pretty important to resilience. Yeah, I think that's that's really that's a great way of putting it, Tim. I mean, I think the other some things that we haven't touched on with with resilience, if I can just bring up, um, one is related to impermanence. In that, in in a in a study that I did with uh, Michelle Barton on uh, adventure racing teams, we were studying their resilience, and and these were teams you know, that are out in the wilderness without, well, they have a tiny little map that may not be, uh, that may not be accurate and they don't have GPS and, uh, stuff like that. And they're there for days and, uh, they have tons of surprises. The environment is bad. They have bees, bears, and, and drunk hunters. And, you know, they're trying to figure out where they are. But in any event, one, one aspect of resilience that kept surfacing was an issue related to impermanence and the idea that, the, you know, that we, that 
we have to get through this. We have to get this through this next mile. We have to, you know, so a big part of, of resilience that I don't think we've tapped into in the, in the organizational literature really relates to this idea of impermanence because oftentimes people in situations like this, they emphasize what's lost, but other people emphasize what's left. And so I, I think, um, I think that's where the hope comes in, you know, that you've got to have, you've got to have some hope, but you've got to be realistic. And so you may be thinking about hope in a little bit different way, not hope that it's going to turn out great, but just hope that it's going to make sense in some, in some kind of way. So I, I think that's, I, I love that kind of idea. What are your research plans moving onwards, especially that you are going to see the effects of this crisis on the health system, which you're both studying, but also on the other type of organizations, right? It's not only the healthcare system that was in a big disruption, oil and gas was in big disruption, other industries similarly, right? Some because they had to grow up really fast, some because they had to scale down really fast. So what's next on your agenda? I... Uh, probably on my agenda, um, it's going to be really going back. Well, number one, I really want to understand all organizational vulner vulnerability in a in a in a, a deeper way. Um, I'm really intrigued with that. But second, in the newspapers in the last couple of days, there have been a lot of there's been a lot of talk about this supply chain issue, and that organizations are now starting to realize that, wow we were much more vulnerable than we thought about because we weren't we weren't concerned with reliability in a way that we you know we were just kind of let let that go i'm not really articulating this very well but i just kind of i'd like to go back to the very basics of reliability and and think about think about that and how it's related to resilience so that's where i'm yeah, I'm going back to what I've been doing. <laughs> I guess that's a way of saying It's always good to revisit. Isn't that what academics do, right? They, they study the same thing for, forever. I, I don't know. Yes, right, right. Just deeper and more refined yeah, exactly. over time. But, but, but Kathy's point about kind of, I, I take what she's saying about supply chain is also broadening the conversation about reliability. There have been some folks who have studied supply chains, like Sheffy has that book, um, you know, that's kind yeah. of, you know, takes that perspective. But, um, but I think most of our high reliability theorizing has been within the organization among the team responding to crisis in some kind of way or, uh, you know, managing particular high hazards. And it doesn't necessarily broaden it out. So I think, your pursuit of that is, I think, something that's necessary and important that, you know, for thinking about resilience, but also thinking about reliability. And I, you know, it's the same thing. So one of the things that I'm going to be building out is kind of broadening, though, our conceptualization of who contributes to that reliability and to that resilience and how do we think about it. So part of that might be the supply chain. Part of it might be some of what we discussed earlier about families, you know, in healthcare settings. But who are those people, those voices that contribute that we aren't paying a, as much attention to. And another thing that might feel wildly unrelated to what we've been talking about, but what I spend a lot of my time uh, thinking about is about neurodiversity in organizations. So uh, so I've started to do research. So this is something that's personally very important to me because my son has multiple disabilities, one of which is uh, he's on the autism spectrum. So I think about autism and there's uh, so I, there's this center on Vanderbilt's campus that I'm a part of and I've been doing research in this domain over the past few years, but about think getting organizations to think about how neurodiversity and people who experience the world and think about the world in fundamentally different ways can actually be a source of resilience, can be a source of reliability, can, and by creating cultures that are more inclusive of neurodiversity and thinking at, rethinking some of those basic mundane everyday practices in order to make organizations more welcoming of neurodiversity and to create a sense of belonging for those who are neurodiverse can also be a powerful tool of of resilience and reliability. I'm looking forward yeah, to the yeah, yeah. Uh, to both of your uh, research. Definitely, I'm kind of kind of curious. Going back to the basics, Thanks. or going back to broadening and understanding the ecosystems and what else we can change and how we can change work practices to make space for that neurodiverse diversity and actually yep. leverage on that. Because yeah. right now we are yeah. just 
yeah, pushing those people aside and not not doing any. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. There are real small experiments that are going on right now. So there's this group of organizations in the, in the U.S., although some in Europe too, where SAP has been a leader in this, where they have these autism at work programs. But like SAP is one of the larger ones, and it's, and it's a couple hundred people, and that organization has tens and tens of thousands of employees, right? Like, so it's the smallest possible slice, but it's good, right? Like it's better than uh, not having jobs, right? Like it's better trying to do something than not. But, you know, in order to meet the scale of people who are on the spectrum, who are underemployed or unemployed, but have real talents to contribute to organizations, we need to do some more kind of fundamental rethinking. Yeah. Anything that maybe I should have asked about topic, resilience and but, I didn't. Uh, ask. I think we've covered. I think we've covered a lot of a lot of great basics. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there is there anything else, Yulia, that came up in your other conversations? Because you've had a range of people who are some who are especially macro, very sociological in orientation, some who are more strategic management, some who are a little bit more organizational behavior and orientation, you know, across these conversations. Are there other things that have come up that are like uh, in tension with or in contradiction with some of the things we've been talking about? I'm, I'm curious if there, or if there are things that people, the others brought up that you're like, huh, I wonder what, how you all would think about that. Because uh, I, I, I think we I think this has been a very comprehensive conversation. So, for, for sure, actually thinking about it, and this is what surprises me, and why I always ask about the definition of resilience is there's not a lot of difference in thinking about resilience. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can have two or three definitions, but they pretty much point to the same thing, and yeah. what everyone is talking about is complementary. Okay. It's not either or. Good. I do feel that sometimes maybe it would be nice to put all the research together yeah. and maybe get all the brains together because everyone is looking at resilience from a different angle or from yeah. a slightly different angle. Yeah. Yeah. And it yep. would be nice to get everything in one pot. Yeah. Because in the end, you're all talking about the same things and all giving yeah. the same type of, uh, same type of, of advice. Yep. Some more broader, some more deeper, some more practical, some more theoretical, but in the end, it all conveys to the same yeah. things. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. is good because that says that there is consistency. Yep. Yeah, the close the closest encapsul is uh, closest to encapsulating the field that I've seen is a paper that that Kathy and was is Trent Williams and Dean Shepard and Dan Gruber had this paper in the Academy of Management Annals in 2017 which I think did a really nice job because it had, you know, cuz Dean and Trent are kind of more strategy entrepreneurship folks. Kathy and Dan are kind of OTOB folks. So it starts to get there. But you're right. There's a lot of, there are some disciplinary differences. And sometimes that's what you're seeing reflected, I think, is some of the, the challenges in management or organizational things, you know, touching on strategy, touching on entrepreneurship, touching on OB, touching on operations, right? Where you're right, there's a little bit degrees of difference. And we're not always in conversation with each other as much as as we maybe should be. And that's something that I think Kathy and I are pretty try to be pretty diligent about in our work. And if you see how we publish, we publish in kind of, you know, uh, funky ways sometimes where we're publishing in a lot of journals that maybe a lot of our peers don't because we're trying to have different kinds of conversations um, and, and to connect to folks that maybe don't get connected. Because even, you know, with even with listing all those uh, fields, I just listed off. I also ignored the kind of health services, healthcare management researchers, the social work researchers who are also in this domain too, the psych community psychologists, right? Like it's, you're right. There is there is not something that I know yeah. of that cuts across all that. No. That would that would seem to be a, a good book uh, that would <laughs> that would do that yeah, work. Exactly. Or good conversations. Uh, so we try. Then yeah. I'm going right. To exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what you're doing. It, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but even this I one tried. is one I by mean, one. In the first, or two by yeah, two. Yeah, the first right. chapter that we wrote <laughs> right. about resilience, yeah. which was published in 2003, we tried yeah. to look at resilience at the individual, the the group, yeah. and the organizational level, and yep. and you know that was our first foray really into this literature yeah. and. I, and I think we did a credible job on that. I mean, when you look at, yep. you know, yep. 
individual resilience, I mean, what I've seen is that there's a, you know, the factors are you got to accept reality. I mean, which is like, you know, making sense of what you're facing. Uh, there has to be a sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, you have to be able to improvise and then you have to have physical and mental, mental fitness. And I think, you know, you, you could say that's what has to happen at a team or an organization level as well. You started off with the meaning and purpose and the, emo, you know, the emotional relational issues, Tim. Um, and we've talked a lot about improvisation, which is critical yeah. that, uh, to do. Yep. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. It's impossible yep. to have organizational resilience without individual resilience. Yeah, but I think it's an empirical question, Julia. I mean, because we don't, you know, we don't really some, know. I mean, if you have patterns of activity in organizations, yeah. does that does that make up for any um, shortfalls in individual resilience? I don't know, Tim, where you come out on that. I'm not sure where I come out. So, so one thing, one thing I think about, I think it's a, an interesting point about the kind of relationship between the individual and the organizational too, is one thing I always worry about is sometimes the most individually resilient action I can take is to leave the organization, which leaves the organization less resilient, right? Like, so I might be highly individually resilient because I, you know, bounce to something better, right? I, I make a, make a, uh, a choice for my own wellness and health and that's more kind of resilient choice uh but it but it leaves the organization you know impoverished because i'm not bringing those same things to the organization so that's that's something i wonder about and i think that's something that's organizations are experiencing right now with this idea the, the great resignation right like where people are just saying i'm i'm going to do things that i'm going to take care of me so i'm going to be individually resilient because i've seen what's happened and i need to reprioritize and to, you know, be good to myself. And that means not doing these things anymore. So sometimes, yeah, sometimes the, the individual and organizational can be intention in that kind of way. But I can see how it can lead to a decrease in resilience, but afterwards a growth in resilience, because if everyone is doing what they actually want to do and where they put the passion exactly. and where they yes. get engaged That's, yes, and they make that conscious decision and they focus on that, yeah. at some point it will lead to an increase yes. in resilience or... At yep. least that's that's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to think about it. And you mentioned, uh, I think, when we were just starting out, Yulia, about you know, kind of thinking about you know, people who have more kind of system or community kind of perspectives on resilience. You're right, and that might be where it manifests, right? Like over time, we should see growth in that, even if there's a maybe, you know, increase in individual resilience, a dip in organizational resilience. But over time, as yeah. people kind of allocate to their well, we, spots, we think right, that, like that are more fulfilling. I mean, we should, okay, we should I'm see just going to say, yeah. we think that because on the other hand, you could yeah, say we think that, 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 that's right. Yeah, we think that's right. You <laughs> have to, I mean, adver oftentimes people forget that adversity is kind of a key element of resilience. I mean, that you resile in, in response to some yeah. kind of adversity. So it may that's be true. that the, or, the individual leaving leaves the organization in a more yep. adverse kind of position and that they have to to respond in some way. So, so I mean, I think that the dynamics sound, sound plausible, yep. <laughs> but, I, but I'll just remind you, it's an empirical question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's get some, let's get some data. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Kathy, Tim, this has been an awesome, awesome conversation. Thank you so much to both of you. You're welcome. I always love doing things with Tim and Yulia. Thank you for inviting us. And anyway, yeah. no, Tim, yes. you're, you're and great. And hopefully we can yeah, uh, turn this into, we are now talking to a university in Finland. And uh, they want to use the series to make it part of the curricula in school. So what I propose to them, I'll talk to them next week, is that uh, why don't we let the students use this and make the essays and everything else, but at the end of it, maybe have a panel with multiple uh, academia where they can actually ask their mm. questions and put everything together. Mm. So maybe that helps get everything in one big pot and discuss about yeah. it. Yeah. So it's an uh, open invitation, and I put you on the spot. Uh. As, as long as, as long as we don't have to speak and finish. Uh, nope. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much to both. Mm -hmm.